Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. We should not be at war with plants. Featuring Professor Julie Stromberg. Julie Stromberg is a retired professor from Arizona State University, where she received her PhD in plant ecology in 1988. While at ASU, she specialized in riparian ecosystems. Much of her research focused on relationships between stream and groundwater hydrology and on effects of ecosystem disturbance, floods and fire, on riparian plant populations, communities, and landscapes. Some of her studies were conducted at reference sites where human influence is minimal, while others were carried out at hydrologically altered sites or at sites undergoing restoration. By understanding pattern and process in riparian ecosystems, she was able to provide resource managers with information that could inform conservation and restoration efforts. She contributed to over 80 scholarly articles during her career and now focuses on non-academic writing. Mickey Hill joined me as the co-host of this episode. Mickey has a degree in environmental science and has worked in restoration and agriculture. Currently, she invests her energy in wild tending efforts. We co-authored a zine together called The Trouble of Invasive Plants, which you can download for free at my blog. Much of our discussion focused on tamarisks, aka salt cedars, a tree of African origin that thrives in riparian areas across the western United States. Tamarisks have been called invasive, but the whole story of this plant, and the reasons for its abundance, is far more complex than that simplistic and unscientific label suggests. We talked about how popular knowledge and policy lags behind science and research, how water use has changed the ecology of the Southwest, how the endangered bird species, the willow flycatcher, has come to depend on tamarisk, how it doesn't make sense that some biodiversity indexes ignore non-native plants in their tallies, the role of scientists in manufacturing myths around tamarisks, how agriculture devastates biodiversity, the role of annuals, native or not, in early ecological succession, how non-native plants can have beneficial ecological effects in their new homes, climate change and plant migration, plant agency and sentience, contemporary alienation from nature and the importance of re-engaging, the healing practice of wild tending, and how an adversarial approach to restoration won't solve the ecological problems we made by being adversarial in the first place. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. To support the podcast financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. You can also become a member at patreon.com, where you'll get early access to podcast episodes and also some exclusive content. This introductory music is by Dr. Dreamchip, an electronic music artist in Portland, Oregon. See show notes for how to follow their work. Without any further ado, here is Professor Julie Stromberg, as interviewed by Nikki Hill and I. Maybe uh, we could start off, Juliet. You could tell us uh, just a little bit about your your background, you know, your education and your experience and, and publications a little bit. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I my entire life I've been in academia. I um, am a botanist and specifically a plant ecologist, and so I um, have been interested in plants my entire life, and, and I'm went to undergraduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and had a wonderful mentor there who was an individual named Forrest Stearns who had worked with the Forest Service. And so he'd come out of this um, sort of a you know, hands-on applied background. And I really liked that, so was this mix of theory and practice. And um, so and I worked with him on 
actually, I continued on, did my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and studied um, an endangered sundew, which is a carnivorous plant that grows in wetlands in the area. And I've always been kind of drawn to the underdog of the plant world, mm-hmm. the, the rare mm-hmm. and the endangered. Um, and then I went, I, I decided to go out west and came out to the Sonoran Desert and for my uh, dissertation work and focused on not just an endangered species, but an endangered community, the the riparian plant communities that grow on the rivers of the of the arid west where water is in short supply. And so you have entire communities of, of um, these riparian systems that are endangered. And so that captivated me. And, um, and I, I was hired on at Arizona State University and was there as, as working with, with graduate students and writing grants and teaching until I retired a, a few years ago. Um, and while I was there, I, I, re, I was focusing on, on this tension between water use by humans and the water needs of, of the riparian plants and trying to determine the water needs and how, just sort of coming at it from the plant perspective, if we want to maintain these, these plants in our rivers, what are their water needs with respect to groundwater, surface water, flood flows? And, and while doing all that, this, this, this idea of the, these invasive species just kind of encroached and people who were so concerned about water use by, by salt cedar and, um, and people were trying to then come up with ways simply just to kill these, these plants that they thought mm-hmm. were taking too much water out of the rivers. And, and so I ended up, some of my research ended up focusing on, um, on the ecological needs and the plant ecology of, uh, sort of introduced species, um, and not necessarily because I was intellectually drawn to it, but because it was, it was, you just couldn't escape it. It, it, <laughs> it was like everyone was so many, so many people were so concerned about these encroachment of these exotics and these invasions. And so I figured, well, I better put my toe in the pot and see what's going on here. <laughs> and then as part of my own research, I, I started some of the myths that I call them myths now, but some of the, these, um, changes that were being ascribed to the salt cedar, I just wasn't seeing on some of the, the rivers I was studying. And I, so I, for my, my own uh, data, was telling me something different than what I was hearing or reading in publications. And I, I started to, I ultimately came to the conclusion that in some, in many, well, at least in the salt cedar case and in some others I realized afterwards, we're kind of scapegoating these plants. Mm-hmm. And blaming them for changes that, you say, we ourselves are calling causing through other ways that we're managing the river systems. I'm putting up, in this case specifically, we're putting up dams and we're reducing flood pulses. We're allowing salt to accumulate in the soils because we don't have flushing flows. And then you have salt cedar that comes in and it'll um, it's a halophyte and it can salinize the soil too. But instead of some so you, instead of blaming the rivers and, and the way we're managing the rivers, we'd manage the plant and thinking, well, so I'm going to just stop there and mm-hmm. right. see where you are with questions. Right. No, that, that's, that's cool. So the, um, so, so, so for people who live in the West, you know, well, any plant person who lives in the Western States knows what tamarisk or, or salt cedar is. Uh, I think mm-hmm. other people who live back east or in the Midwest maybe haven't, you know, heard of it or know about it. And so one thing that I've that I found in my research was that in the Western U.S., it is the third most frequently occurring woody riparian plant and the second most abundant species along rivers. And that's that, mm-hmm. does that sound about right to you? Those. Yeah. Um, it, and and. It was, it's also it, it seems to be simply a, it, it's a it's not just one species there are multiple species that are hybridizing and interbreeding so it's a it's a species swarm I guess you could call it because many different species have been introduced from Eurasia and they are now interbreeding and um, so genetically it's actually distinct from from uh, what's going on in, in in the old world now but yeah it's become very abundant um, and it's a 
it's kind of it's a tall shrub or a small tree, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, it has beautiful white pink flowers that attract a lot of um, a lot of bees and other pollinating insects. Mm-hmm. But um, and one of the reasons that it's become so abundant in the West is because um, it's one of those plants that has been able to thrive under the conditions, the new conditions that we've created along our Western rivers. They're, they're drier. We've, we've drawn down the, the water table and, and salt cedar is very deep rooted. Um, we've modified the, the flood pulses. Um, and there are trees, this is a, there's a tree called Fremont Cottonwood and another one called Gooding Willow. And it's well known now that they, they rely on these spring floods to have new generations of, of seedlings produced because they just release their seeds for a short time in, in, in spring and you know, timed with the, the spring flood pulses. Um, salt cedar is more of a generalist. It produces, she produces seeds multiple times a year and can take advantage of disturbance whenever it happens. Um, and also more salt tolerant than some of the other species in the area. And so if we don't have these flushing flows because we're damming the rivers to um, divert water to our cities and, and fields, uh, so the si- systems get a little more salty. So uh, to me, salt cedar is just a survivor. She's, she's salt tolerant. She's tolerant of drought. She can, um, she likes disturbance, but isn't picky about when that disturbance occurs. So she's a really good fit for the way we've modified mm-hmm. our rivers. Yeah, I find um, salt cedar personally fascinating too. Um, I've spent many lovely afternoons and had adventures around her. And um, I've even seen the willow flycatcher uh, in the salt cedars in Arizona. Um, but uh, it's it's interesting to me too that like we're talking, you're talking about all these um, different different disturbance regimes that are happening with the anthropogenic landscape. And mm-hmm. um, some of them are, you know, more regular than it might be without the human influence, or uh, the pressure is more relentless in one certain way. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I think that those generalist adaptabilities, in some way, it's like, the perfect fit for uh, relationship with plants if we want to keep um, living in the way that we're living. Uh, some of these plants will be the friends that enable us to do that. We may not see the whole uh, picture yet of how they help maintain balances, but that it's um, could be very bad news for us if we cut them out right away. <laughs> yes, and, and I think some people... We sort of we idealize the world and 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 we want to put things back the way they were. Mm-hmm. We don't want to see so much disruption and change. Um, and yet, we're vilifying the very plants that are tolerating us and and adapting to to the conditions we're creating and providing beneficial functions, be it. Um, nitrogen fixing and, and increasing the, the uh, nutritive capacity of the soil or just basic functions of carbon fixation and pollination. And so, so we're, yeah, we're, we're vilifying those who are actually managing to tolerate and thrive under the conditions we're creating. And, and that's, that's not a really um, <laughs> intelligent approach, <laughs> but, it, but it's sad, I think, because, um, mm. I mean, I've been out with people, friends that have been in the park service or whatever, and we're walking around, and, and they'll just say, oh, I can't. We, we're walking along the ditch. I, I live across from a cotton field in, in South Phoenix, and, um, and, and you know, what is native to a ditch? <laughs> um, you have lots of plants that are adapted to, say, from Eurasia or wherever, and just adapted to the, to the, to the conditions that you have along, along crop fields. And to me, they're my friends. You know, they're... they're um, I'm glad to see them. I'd rather have them there than nothing. And and, mm-hmm. and she was just like, just horrified that that I would actually like these plants. But then, in a way, it's other people. It's like setting down a burden. It's like, oh, oh, you mean I don't have to hate them? Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And, and, 
and it's kind of tied up with, with hate. I mean, some people just don't like the human species mm-hmm. and what we're doing. And they, and as an extension of that, they don't like these plants that we may have brought in and facilitated. It's like an extension of self hatred. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. you don't have to do that. You know, you can actually, actually like, like them and appreciate them. I've seen some of those big cotton fields in, in Arizona. Um, currently, I'm living in southwestern New Mexico, so I've driven to Phoenix on not on the highway, on the freeway, but on those back roads, you know, and uh, through some yeah. of those, yeah, through some of those little agricultural towns there, and it's fascinating, of course, to see big fields of cotton. It's also crazy to see these large monocrops in a desert area that it doesn't seem logical at all that there would be enough water here for that type of agriculture, you know? Um, and so obviously the history of, of, you know, the settler colonial project coming in and, and imposing all of these things on the landscape has had a tremendous effect on the landscapes, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and then yes, obviously those, those, those changes have brought, um, a set of plants with them because there are already plants that were adapted to our agricultural disturbances and have been adapting to them for six, eight, ten thousand years, you know, in Europe and in Asia. So, you know, we come here, we create a particular type of disturbance, and then plants that are adapted to exactly that disturbance then do well in that area. And then we say, oh, that's a bad plant. And it's like, well, now wait a minute. Yeah. that's 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 reversing that's 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 turning it around it's the disturbance that is the cause here not that, that that's causing an, an an environment that's good for the plant not a plant that's creating a disturbance you you make a distinction in one of your papers right, between um right between passenger and driver and i think that's a really a really good 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 way of putting it the passenger versus driver contrast right right and not that the plants aren't having uh, exerting effects on the landscape but but um right yeah they're the um and yeah i mean it's it's really i mean being a specialist in riparian ecology i mean i've seen so many of these big rivers the the gila the colorado the, the santa cruz the hydro just being sucked dry i mean mm-hmm. it's, it's 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 depressing and sad and and there's a one thing that I've run to, into frequently is that um, sometimes people get more upset over, um, like, with, re- I mean, with restoration ecology, people want to go back to, say, a condition of you know, some time in the past. past. Um, but they want that for the, for the biota. Mm-hmm. But to have, the, to have that happen, you also have to have the... the um, the, the water infrastructure, the 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 processes that, that influence these plants, that has to be changed too. And so if you if you're not willing to take out the dams or, or put water back in the rivers or um, reduce some of our technological hold on these systems, if you're not going to do that, then you better accept that there are going to be other plants that are going to come in. And mm-hmm. so people don't always make that connection between our control of, of, of resources and the response of the biota. Yeah. I'm not sure right. if I said that quite well. No, no, I, I followed you. And, 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 you know, of course the, the water resources in the Western states have been, you know, precious and fought over for, you know, at least a couple of hundred years at this point. And so that was kind of where the dislike or hatred for the salt cedar began, right? Is that they were, yeah. There were the first claims that were made about why that was a quote bad plant was because they were saying that it was taking up too much water, and the parties who were talking about this were interested. It, to them, if these trees were sucking down water, then they could cut down the trees. Say that's how much water was saved, and that's right. how much water we can now use. Right. right? So there was a there was a commercial mm-hmm. a commercial motivation there uh, at the very beginning of talking about that plant. Yes, and some of the early studies that were done on salt cedar water use, use um, the way the, the studies were constructed, they had these, these giant pot experiments. Um, they ended up uh, drastically overestimating the amount of water transpired by an individual salt cedar. And it wasn't until a couple decades later that um, other researchers using different techniques, more modern techniques, realized that the water use 
the transpiration rate and water use rate of salt cedar did not differ appreciably from the other plants in the system. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet you still see some people using that now outdated information to justify clearing of salt cedar. Um, so there's part of it is just a people can catch up with, with, with the knowledge base. So, but, um, mm-hmm. and so it's, it's, it's just you know, we thought we had, with all the new publications that had come out, that we'd put that issue to rest. But it, it, it keeps rising. It's rising again. Yeah, it's hard to it's hard for everybody to catch up. I think, um, especially with uh, the conversation of sustainability starting to appear in many different industries, um, people are all kind of wondering what that means and how they do something. Mm -hmm. And so when they start to investigate what that might look like, they pick up the language that's already there from like uh, conservation or Mm -hmm. restoration ecology. But it is kind of like the most popular um, ideologies, not necessarily what's uh, current understanding as we continue to observe what's going on in our world, which is not... um, stationary um these relationships are changing the more dynamics you add into them all the time so um that's that's a part that i've been seeing and that's a part of my work uh lately has been trying to address this language that's starting to spread into different avenues that haven't been uh considering those things before and actually it's worrisome Mm -hmm. because it makes that language even stronger um in more places than it used Mm -hmm. to be uh applicable. So um, I have a, we had a couple of questions about the whole plants uh, using water idea. There's this term phreatophytes, and that was Mm -hmm. a term for very thirsty trees, right? Well, specifically, it's it's phreato, um, the root phreato is indicating that it's a a user of groundwater. So phreatophytes are those that have the roots down into the aquifer and so in a river system you can have you have the surface water well and not in not in all rivers in some rivers they're ephemeral and then well, some rivers will flow year round others will flow just have surface flow periodically throughout the year um but the uh, uh, a key water source for many of these riparian trees that are on the floodplain that may be a hundred meters away from the this actual stream channel, they're relying on water that's in that, that floodplain aquifer, which mm-hmm. may be, sometimes it can be just a few feet below the surface, uh, it can, or it can be um, you know, 10 or 20 meters below the surface. So, um, so yeah, so the, the phreatophytes um, would include oh, you know, cottonwoods and willows and salt cedar and velvet mesquite. Um, and delta mesquite is an incredibly deep-rooted plant. It can go down. People have found its roots, one extreme case, of 50 meters below the ground surface. Wow. Um, that's atypical. But you can have a cottonwoods generally, there's sort of this groundwater threshold. They won't, you need to maintain the, the water table at about 10 feet below the surface or, or they won't survive. Um, Hmm. And so the the rooting depth of a plant and how how deep it can get its water from, it, as you start changing the depth of groundwater, you can start changing the composition of the, the plant community. Yeah. So phreatophytes is more more the term for the tap rooted riparian trees that are going yeah, to and different so depths. within the, the the group of phreatophytes, some of them are going to be more heavy users of water than others, and that can relate to. More, more the leaf size, like the, the leaf area, like the, the broadleaf plants, like the Fremont cottonwood, they're they're using a lot of a lot of water. Whereas the the smaller leaf plants, the more drought adapted, even though they may have deep roots and they're using groundwater, they might they're probably not transpiring as much as some of these the broadleaf species are. And so that's another measure of use is. They're, they're, the definition of use is how much water they're taking from the ground and evapotranspirating into the air, and that's considered use. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because I, I was... Um, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and, and sometimes the, we're just people 
some people are just thinking that of just as a loss. It's like oh, it's, it's water that's not being used for other purposes. Well, the, the transpirational water is providing lots of cooling for one thing, and so uh-huh. many you see many. Like uh, Tucson and some other cities are planting trees like crazy just because to help uh, uh, keep keep people cool as as the as the temperatures are rising. Um, yeah. So there's value to that water use, and and that water is not just water loss. There's functions associated with it. Well, and plants also make rain with evapotranspiration. Ultimately, correct. <laughs> Like that's a part of the um, water cycle. Yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely, it's part of the water cycle, and and then you have some some of the plants like the mesquite are these uh, as, as they're taking water up from the aquifer, some of that can leak into the shallower soil layers and actually um, provide water for for some of the shallower rooted plants. Yeah, yeah, I've been fascinated with this uh, concept lately of how plants need the water and trees need the water, but how the water also needs the plants. Um, I think uh, that sometimes the idea of water availability can be simplified to like above ground or aquifer water, like above ground flowing water, or stored water or underground aquifers. But the actual like storage of water is happening between soil particles within plant roots. Um, and the movement of that is from this capillary action that's like pulling water from further down, either uh, via between the soil particles or through the plant roots, and that plant roots also respire in the soil. So they're like constantly taking up water, respiring small amounts, and keeping those the, the relative moisture of the soil um, relatively even in certain areas and that perhaps if we didn't have the vegetation there um, some of the capillary action would cause the lower soil levels to evaporate Um, well evaporation would maybe happen to a lower depth uh, because you would have the action of the water pulling up in the soil and then being exposed to the surface and evaporating Um, and you wouldn't have roots there to be containing and storing some of that and then regulating the, the content in those those higher uh, levels. Um, I don't know how scientifically correct all of this is, but I've just kind of been wondering about this whole idea of uh, plants as users of water and how maybe they are needed for water to ev- even be retained in the landscape. Yeah, those are interesting questions. Um, you also can have those, there's, like when the the roots die, you can have water flowing through the the um, the old root locations. It's kind of like a little highway, analogous to say if you would have somebody's in the desert, um, and you have or riparian systems where you'll have gophers or other animals that are digging holes. Uh, you have creating this little little highways pathways through which the water can flow and infiltrate. Uh, more thoroughly into the system um, so they can mm-hmm. go down whether the hole is created by an animal or by a plant root or, or plant action. Yeah, there's, there's, um, that that's is an interesting area. Yeah. Yeah, on the on the topic of the salt cedar in the, or the tamarisk in its in and in, 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 in the environment, um, the obviously any plant in the environment is going to be fulfilling some kind of ecological function, right? And so the mm-hmm. now that there's so many areas there where there is tamarisk, now that it's so common, you know, it seems like there's probably birds, animals, and even other plants that have come to depend on it being there. Yeah, and, and I think with respect to animals, probably the most study that's been done with with the for salt cedar has, has been within the bird communities, and you mentioned the willow flycatcher earlier, and, and um, the the southwestern willow flycatcher, which is an, an endangered species, um, been declining because its habitat has been declining. Um, it, it is one that it finds the the salt cedar quite suitable for building nests and and for fledging young. Um, adequate insects that are 
provided in in the salt cedar thickets. Um, and so, yeah, so it's it's one that this it's created some interesting tension within the the uh, academic community um, <laughs> because you have this you have this endangered bird that's utilizing what some people refer to as an invasive plant, and so and you have biocontrol measures going on to re- reduce and kill the salt cedar. But meanwhile, you have the well of flycatcher advocates saying, "Hey, this is." <laughs> If, if unless you're putting back the the willows, the gooding willows and other plants, trees that the bird was nesting in, if you do away with the salt cedar, you're going to do away with with this endangered bird. So that yeah, that's that's an interesting story to follow over the years. Right. I mean, um, just because given that when, it's. Oh, go ahead. Oh. I was going to say the other thing that when we start talking about, you know. This plant and that plant, it's, it really need to be thinking of sort of the, the community of, of plants that are there. And mm-hmm. if you have a, say, a thicket of nothing but cottonwood or, or you know, a cottonwood plantation or a, a, nothing but salt cedar, you're going to have fewer uh, animal species associated with it. And, and so there was, there was some interesting work done on um, bird communities and showing that Oh, say a threshold to say of like if, if the salt cedar didn't compose more than about fifty or sixty percent of the entire um, biomass of the system, you know, if you had other things around like the cottonwoods and the willows, you end up if you add salt cedar to that mix, then you even end up even with more niches and more species than you did before. So, um, there's yep. there's that aspect. Yeah, that reminds me. Uh, sorry, of the. Um, I was surprised to find out that uh, it seems like for in a lot of cases, um, researchers are not always including so-called invasive species into the biodiversity indexes, which seems like a false reading of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, and there's been there's been a lot of. Um several articles that have been published about that that very thing and it which at face value it just seems it strikes me as just utterly bizarre like why would you not count something in your tally it would be like if you were going to take do a, a census of your neighborhood and say oh you're hispanic we're not going to count you you know um mm-hmm. <laughs> like where you're just enfranchising certain components of the ecosystem because you say that they don't belong or they came from somewhere else it's, it's just it 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 takes like suddenly you're, you've gone from this objective scientist mode to wearing some other hat altogether, and it's just it's just concerning to say the least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you wrote uh, a paper that uh, let me see if I can if I can bring it up here: uh, changing perceptions of change, the role of scientists, the role mm-hmm. of scientists in tamarics and river management. And so in this paper, you were talking about the roles that scientists have played in creating kind of a myth around around the, the salt cedar tree and its effects. And these have had to do with things like inappropriate citations and uh, a sort of reflexive but perhaps unconscious bias against, you know, exotic plants. And so I think this is a really interesting thing to talk about because you know, the layperson is just like, oh, you know, scientist said this, then okay, science, great, science, it's settled, you know, and they're not taking into account, you know, the whole process that's that's going on there. Yeah, and, and scientists are subject to the same evolutionary biases that other people's are. We other people <laughs> that other people are. Um, mm-hmm. we're not immune. We make mistakes, we make we make over the years, go back and look at the papers we wrote and say, oh, gosh, I know more now than I did then, and, and say, um, here's an update. <laughs> so, um, and, I mean, science is not static, and, and every scientist's word is not gold, and and raising a generation of more critical thinkers is really important um, mm-hmm. to to allow us to, to use the products of science in, in a more um, enlightened way. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, the the, the paper about the the, the the salt sugar. There were there were some, and and partly in that that paper, yeah, there were some citations that people were were using and, and would just repeat and cite and not go back to the original source. And so if if if, if someone had said something in error, the error could be propagated mm-hmm. <laughs> because. Maybe no one who did you didn't have the time or, or or ability to go back at that time and and track get get the primary source for all the information, which is the ideal world. That's what we'd want to do. But sometimes you may not. You're just pressed for time. You don't do it. And you just assume that the person that cited didn't know what they were talking about. So yeah, so that that you can have errors propagate that way. It's a fascinating exercise, actually, uh, for anyone out there who might want to try this is to uh, take an article and go through the references back to their sources. It's actually a very enlightening and fascinating process that I've done a couple of times and I'm still engaging in. It is, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's where they came from. Oh, and that's, and then you get back and it's like, some, it's just someone's anecdote. It's like, wait, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> yeah. I think we need more studies on this. Yeah, because I think people might be surprised that 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 so often you know, these things that get that, that get cited or that, that are generally believed or whatever do go back to just one study in some cases that gets repeated over and over again. And then when you go back and read the original study, you can find problems with the with the methodology or at least limitations to the to the methodology, you know. Yeah. Or or if I could um interject, mm-hmm. there's this idea of environmental context that some mm-hmm. uh, some um statement might be true under context A, but it might not occur under a different context. And so you can have, like, you could say the statement that salt theater salinite causes an increase in salt content of the soil. It might be true, might be true under in certain rivers, systems, conditions, but not in others. And so something can actually be, be true depending on, it's like in, in a typical scientist response to something is, um, Yes, maybe, or you know, yes, depending. <laughs> like, um, and so this idea of environmental context and how that can influence sort of truth um, of, of a statement is, I think, it gets ignored um, by the general public, and they think that something is if something is true, it's true all the time. Well, not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like the the interpretation becomes the problem because it gets applied so broadly. I've wondered mm-hmm. if part of that process is because we're so eager to have feel like we have an understanding about what we're doing and we don't leave enough room for I don't know yet. <laughs> right, right. We, we want things to be black and white and, and crystal clear and, and the world is, there's so much information that we're dealing with these days. It's like mm-hmm. we, it, it gets overwhelming to, to maintain that capacity to sort of question everything. Um, yeah when there's so much we're dealing with on a daily basis. But like in terms of ecological differences, for example, you know, there's what I've heard called the island effect or island effects where very different things can happen on islands, especially small islands, than what happen on a, on a continent-wide basis. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's certainly true. And I mean, especially when it comes to introducing new species. Like, like I saw... When I was studying, writing about some of these things a year or two ago, I, I, I kept running across this figure of like, oh, quote, invasive species cost, you know, the economy X amount of dollars a year, you know. And so I, I was, mm-hmm. you know, following following the trails back on the citations on that and found that, you know, a lot of it was going back to this one study that was, you know, had pulled half of its data from Hawaii and half of it from the continental United States, but only a handful of states in the United States. And if you took the data from Hawaii and put it aside, then suddenly the, you know, effects, you know, uh, of the exotic plants went way down, you know, because they were... Yeah, yeah, that's a really good example. Um, and the other one, this the, the there was a, a paper a while back about... Um, Exotic plants being the second greatest threat to biodiversity, which right um, a catchy title and mm-hmm. and people that propagated widely. My husband Matt Chu, who's he's more of the historian of invasion biology and is, is, is his specialty. He traced 
that back, and it it, it relates to the, the data set from which that statement was was drawn and was based on fish in a certain region. So it, <laughs> it you can't apply that to plants, as I mean, plants are not the second introduced plants are not the second greatest cause of biodiversity loss. In fact, um, there are very few cases where an introduced plant has actually caused uh, the extirpation of another plant. So it, the processes that go on in the plant world are very different than, than go, that go on, say, between a predator and a prey. So, yeah, and I mean, and, and applying a statement like that across taxa, across geographic regions, um, that's just completely ignoring environmental contacts and, and differences between yeah. uh, organisms. Right. And then when it comes to this term invasive, I think that a lot of people hear it and they feel like, oh, this is a, an actual sort of scientific term. I think a lot of lay people assume and they don't realize that, well, no, there's not actually, that's not actually a scientific term per se. That there's not actually a one definition of that. If you try to find one, you're, I mean, you're not in luck on that one, you know? Yeah, yeah, and and if, w the students, if, when I was in academia, uh, whether they were graduate students or, or undergraduates, they would get caught up in that language, and, and I would ask them, if they would be writing a proposal or something, or, or an assignment, I would ask them to, to rewrite it, setting aside words like invasive that are not... Um, that don't have a that are that are more of a, a a cultural kind of cultural overlay to them. Set those words aside and write write it just using neutral scientific language. And it was such a great exercise um, because it, it it makes people think a little harder. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you you don't otherwise you're starting from the assumption that oh this 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 organism is, is detrimental. It's harmful. It's bad. Which is themselves are judgment calls and like what does that mean ecologically what are the processes you know let's just get scientifically neutral and objective about this and um yeah the the those the spillover of these these terms from um into into the scientific world is, is disturbing yeah and like, oh. I, I guess oh, go ahead oh i was just re remembering when i was in school for environmental science uh hearing the term invasive and at that time was mm -hmm. the early 2000s and it wasn't being used in the way it's used today it was talking about trying to describe a relationship in a particular situation in the environmental context again um so that was surprising to me when i got out of school into um actually you know being employed <laughs> how it was being used in a very different way than it was presented to me in in school which was more of a relationship based um query not a mm -hmm. delineation like that. Right, because at the very most, I, I would say that invasive really, if it describes anything, is describing the behavior uh, of, a, of a plant or a, or a species and not the not the species itself. That's the mistake. That's the first mistake that's made there is applying that term to the species as if it is just a quality of that species rather than... Right, right. Right, rather than seeing it as being maybe a way of describing the behavior of that species, but again, obviously that it's not a neutral sounding term at all, and mm -mm. so it's not it's not very helpful in describing in describing behavior either. Right, and again, we're back to context. Under some conditions, certain species are going to thrive, and other conditions, they're not. And, um, right, and I, I really yeah, found it. I found it telling the example you gave of walking along the cotton fields, you know, because I feel like, you know, um, you know, I, I go, to, I, I'm, I'm in some different native plant groups and social media online because they're really great for plant ID. And of course you hear about invasive stuff there all the time, you know, and like, you know, it, it, that kind of really describes it of like, Oh, here I am standing in front of a, you know, 40 acre cotton fields, right. Complaining about, the plants that are in the ditch next to the fields 
and not saying anything about the cotton field mm-hmm. itself, you know, and, and the obvious effects mm-hmm. that that's having. And the fact that the biodiversity in this monocropped cotton field is a biodiversity of exactly one plant species or whatever. I mean, you know, especially mm-hmm. now that they've got the Roundup Ready crops, and I believe cotton is one of them right. that they've GMO'd for that, right? So they can literally get it down to just one species in that entire in that entire field. And like, well, that's the that's the issue there is is that we're doing yeah. things that way. Yeah, and I, I guess the thing that maybe bothers me the most about the preoccupation with invasive exotics is that. It diverts us from other more critical issues, and people people want to do things. They want to be helping the environment. They want to be, you know, be out there doing good things, and and oftentimes that people just get told to remove this plant, and you know, and and, and actually they can take their frustrations out of it, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and they're outdoors, and that's good. But it, it's it's not getting at these root causes of. Um, why are the plants here in the first place? Why are the plants you want to be here not here? Well, it's, those are the deeper issues of we're, we're changing climate, we're, we're diverting water, we're still expanding um, housing developments, and we're mining. And you know, I mean, we're just such a disruptive species, and we're transforming so much of the planet. Um, and and how do you go to a more sustainable way of life and it's just that is such a, a, a more, you know sort of a wicked problem. It's such a more difficult thing to do than just go out and blame it on a plant and then and weed for the day and think you've done done something beneficial. Mm. And it, it's it's um, I mean I, I'm a gardener. I sometimes it's fun to just go out and weed, you know. But yeah. but I know this idea that we're going to weed the planet, you know, and weed the wildlands is um, it, it, it's it's not ultimately beneficial to us it's not it's 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 teaching people to to hate plants which i I really don't like it's um it's just not fostering a good relationship between us and and the organisms these plants that are supporting us and and doing so many good things for us it's it's kind of painful to to watch Mm-hmm. I, I just I would love to see a more real, loving relationship between us and the plants that are growing around us, regardless of where they came from. And 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 I just think we need to stop calling calling names, calling calling these our plant friends by these by these derogatory terms. Yeah, I feel <laughs> I feel like we we forget in in this that sentiment too that the rest of the world is sentient and alive and provides for us <laughs> and in that respect yes. um they might know what they're doing so maybe we could yes. um collaborate more and if we're feeling lost and yes. um not knowing what to do mm-hmm. uh we have other yes. people to look to like the plant people <laughs> and a part of that is, yeah, this is un- this- looking at the relationship of cause and effect for our our actions with each other, you know. <laughs> yeah, and just go out and just listen to the plants and, and respect the plants. And it, this, there's this whole idea of control, that, that we control the plants, we control everything. It's like, well, we don't. Yeah. <laughs> and and the more, when, we, when we delude ourselves into thinking that we do, it, it just backfires. And, and and I think that's part of what this native was movement is like we we want to control the landscape we want to put it back the way it was but 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 we're going at it the wrong way so just just loosen the reins a little bit realizing realize that all of us have agency whether we're plant or primate and just respect the role of these creatures that kind of know what they're doing you know yeah (laughs) and and, uh uh, if they if, if they're producing seeds and blowing in and coming in and stabilizing the soil and uh, let them do it. Now it's like, don't, don't be so quick to judge whether or not we think they belong or not. Let's just kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, who are we to say that these, these you know, that, that these plants that are, that are coming, that that's not the very first step in what's supposed to be happening there? Right. 
Yeah, we're an arrogant species, and it kicks us in the butt sometimes. <laughs> scientists can be very arrogant, and if a scientist says something, that carries weight. And so scientists have to be extra careful about what they're saying. Right. Just as a politician or anyone that's in, in some sort of power position. Right. Well, and, and that can be that can be tricky, too, because, of course, there are, you know, I mean, you know, if you want to look into the effects of glyphosate, you know, you want to not do you want to really be careful about what a scientist whose funding is coming from Monsanto is saying about glyphosate? You do. I mean, not all science is created equal, I guess I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, we, we have this term invasive, but if we throw that out, we say, say, you know, pioneer species, for example, you know, as a species that mm-hmm. comes into a disturbed area first, then we can view a lot of these mm-hmm. species as being just a, a, a first level of succession. Right. Right. I remember being uh, um, out in the Channel Islands of off the coast of California and, and people were concerned about um, some of these annual weeds that had come in and so they'd be out there removing the annual plants and it's like wait a minute mm-hmm. <laughs> you're, you're just creating more disturbance you're just propagating this um, these early successional not these early successional conditions and and just leave it alone it's a, it's a, the time scale issue is, is another interesting idea here because um as creatures that live for a hundred years or so um we we can be awfully impatient and and (laughs) we want things to happen now or or yesterday and and maybe it's going to take two or three or years or 10 or 20 um to just leave the system alone and and let it let it change into um, change and evolve on and adapt on its own Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I interviewed Tao Orion, the author of um, Beyond the War on Invasive Species, she told the story of a plot of agricultural land in New England uh, that this person owned and, and had been in this plot in their back 40 or whatever had been taken over by uh, Scotch broom, which, you know, is a, mm-hmm. a perennial leguminous plant. You know, it, it does well in disturbed areas and uh, actually is a nitrogen fixer as well. So it's improving the soil while it's there. Uh, happens also to be, you know, mm-hmm. not native to New England. And so it's it's much hated. Uh, it's a very hated plant by a lot of people, you know. Um, and this woman who's the landowner didn't do anything about it, just let it stay there. And after, and she was, you know, lived mm-hmm. there her whole life. And after quite a while, it was like 30 years or something, which is about how long the short term, you know, short lived perennial you know, lives, uh, it, it, the the scotch room all died back. And underneath, it was all saplings from the native trees in the area or the trees that you would expect in the area, you know. And so there, yeah. the best thing to do was just to let it let it go, you know. Let it go, yeah. Yeah. Instead of going in and just, just perturbing. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, Kudzu is another one that is an interesting example. And it's one I don't really know a lot about because I haven't person who lived in the south and, and studied the species but in reading about it you get I get the impression that um it's a rapidly sprawling vine that that is it's a legume and a nitrogen fixer and you start reading about the history of the south and, and just the overuse of these fields for cotton and tobacco and even going back to the damage from war and and you have these, these soils that are easily erodible and and so you've had this massive Soil loss and loss of fertility, and 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 then you had kudzu coming in, and and it gets vilified simply because it's overabundant, and or people perceive it that way, and thinking that it's preventing other things from coming in. But yeah, but but just be a little patient, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you can, we can, we sort of raise this idea that we can have everything we want whenever we want, um, but we just we need to be just slow down a little bit. Yeah, some things take time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a certain logic, mm-hmm. too, that, you know, the plants that are going to be the ones most able to deal with our disturbances are the ones who have been doing that, have been dealing with our disturbances for thousands of years already. And those are not going to be, you know, there hasn't been enough time yet for for plants in this hemisphere, you know, in the new world to to 
to do that yet. So of course, these ones that we brought with us are, are they're the first line of defense. They're from the beginning, they've been Mother Nature saying, Oh, you're making a disturbance. Let me fix that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you, you in the in the field of ecology for a long time, people were preoccupied with negative interactions like competition between species and um, and ignoring sort of positive processes like facilitation, where one plant is benefiting another, and 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 so the attributes of the of the, the people that are studying the system um, influence what we know about the system. And, and so for a long time, this, this idea of plants competing with each other just prevailed, but there, but there's a lot of facilitation and, and that goes on as well. And so. Sometimes it seems to me like we're, we're still stuck in the Victorian age and, and, you know, in the popular mind anyway, in terms of our view of, of the world and these things. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, uh, Certainly could be true, um, and this notion of sort of boundaries and, and where species belongs is just one of those that's kind of a historical uh, artifact that I think <laughs> needs to be needs some updating. This idea that a plant has a defined territory or a range, and that if it moves out of that that map we drew. Or, uh, uh, those boundaries we drew on a map that says this is your territory that if it goes beyond that that boundary it's it's now it non native it's just it's just a, um, right and that's it, it's not in keeping with with current views of, of plant migration and, and movement and um so yeah there are some things that are kind of a bit archaic that they're, that are hanging on right because now we've got climate change which is you know measurably having effects on the ranges of plants where you know there's different plants you can look up and see oh these trees are this kind of tree is now you know moving this many meters up you know in elevation every year this plant is moving this many you know kilometers north you know etc as time goes on and so the that that's one of the issues that i have the most with the invasion biology is that it seems to be ignoring or even denying uh, climate change, because with climate change, no plant is going to be staying in its own. They're not going to be staying in their old ranges anymore. Right, and different plants are, are moving across the landscape at different rates, and and some are being uh, assisted by by humans. But but we're another element of the ecosystem, and mm-hmm. so there's this this, dis- this disconnect between humans as being part as being not part of the ecosystem. Well, first of all, the, the, this is the broad disconnect some people don't even see humans as animals so if you don't think of humans as animals uh, as a primate as a mammal um you're not going to see us as, as part of an ecosystem either and so <laughs> but we are we're 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 a, uh, we're a primate we're a mammal we're we're moving uh, the other species around as we move because we're we're globally distributed and so we're going to be distributing all sorts of things um I don't see that as some people say that's unnatural. I don't see it as unnatural. Um, I, so there's um, some of these basic fundamental ideas of how we perceive ourselves as creatures in the universe that you, you need to get tap into that and, and discuss. Um, because I, I don't know, did you guys grow up thinking that you guys were were the somehow different that you weren't an animal and you were different that that animals were different from us? Oh, definitely. I, I grew up uh, Catholic, you know, religious background. So there was definitely this mm-hmm. idea that, you know, we're, there was, we were not really referred to as animals. And of course, we had dominion over everything. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get it that mm-hmm. strong, but I think that it's just kind of in the culture. And it's a really arbitrary line to be drawing um, uh, acceptable species migrations where humans had anything to do with it. And a big part of that reason is that it ignores a huge part of human history (laughs) where uh, people were already, of course, always traveling with their seeds and moving things from different continents. And yes, Mm -hmm. going by boat to different continents and bringing the plants there. And uh, some of the ones we would consider native today were not always from here. Like, it's just... 
a strange arbitrary right. line to draw acceptable movement at the line of whether human had any involvement. And I think that it yeah. speaks deeply to our self-loathing. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. And this idea of how long does someone have to be somewhere before they're considered native? You know, 200 years? 400 years? You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's very arbitrary. Um, and some of the plants that people were moving were were plants that had value to humans. That's why they brought them. And so, um, yeah. Many, they're either medicinal or, or nutritious or, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that. Um, but I, I mean, I didn't. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. I was going I did. I didn't grow up with a with a religious um, uh, influence, but but it, it was just absorbed from the the culture that. Um, but I, I can remember as, as a child, like my brother and I, were close in age, and we grew up in the um, eastern deciduous forest, and our backyard was filled with with oak trees and my mom was a gardener and, and we'd, we, we climbed trees and we loved climbing the trees and occasionally my dad would come and cut down one of the trees. Um, and I remember Eric and I thinking, well, gosh, this is, this is a sentient creature and dad's just killing it. Like, you know, it wasn't alive. And it was like, <laughs> I remember mm-hmm. feeling really conflicted. It's like, is this tree dead or is it alive? You know, or is it a living creature or not? And, and, um, and still today, so many people don't even think of trees as being usable sentient creatures with agency but they are and Mm -hmm. the world is it's so much richer when when you come to that realization and appreciation because you can go outside and walk down the street and it's just filled with plant friends you know (laughs) yeah it makes the world a richer place yeah the the idea that plants are are not you know really alive, you know, and are not, you know, sentient and have agency in their own way. Of course, that idea is very new. Like, uh, people knew that about plants for many, many thousands of years and and behaved uh, appropriately. And it's really a very modern, you know, thing to to no longer believe that about plants, to no longer perceive that about plants. Yeah. And it's fascinating, during my retirement years, um, I've been spending a lot of time volunteering at an animal shelter that is near my house, and and just understanding the extent to which dogs have these complex emotions and ability to understand um, and pick up um, what we're saying and what we're feeling, and, and, and smiling and showing expression on their face. And, and, and that's even modern, this idea that... that um, Something like a like a, a dog is 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 uh, not that different from us in terms of its mammalian um, capacities, and and then yeah, so setting that aside, but yeah, the, then accepting that plants are are also um, these intelligent creatures with agency. Yeah, that that's just to me. I'm I'm so seeped in that now. It's like, well, sure, why not? But then you really talk to someone else, and it's like, what? You know, are you crazy? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's still a long way to go to to um, to get away from our sort of human exceptionalism that, you know, that we're not that different from other creatures on this planet. We just like to think we are. Some of us do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a a lot of um, healing that could happen in this process of remembering that uh, we're not alone and separate as we think we are. Um, Ooh, yes. Yeah. Yes, a lot lot of healing that can go on. Because we, when you say that you're different, all of a sudden you're alone. You're Mm -hmm. not like the others. But when you accept that you are, it's like suddenly the the world is just this wonderful place to be. I mean, you're not alone. You you can form connections with with plants, with 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 dogs, with the birds, and and um, and and I've been really getting into this into ecotherapy lately, and and this Mm -hmm. role of of ecosystems as as places of of healing, whether whether it's bird song or just the the smells of the plants. We've got Bursera in our yard, which is a plant that's um, related to frankincense and myrrh. And so, I mean, you have mm. all these sensory elements, but then, you know, beyond the sight and the sound and, and, and the, the visuals and the beauty, there's just this idea, these, these creatures are alive, you know, and, 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 and they're, we're connected. We're all part of, we're all living creatures. We're all part of the same ultimately. Um, 
and 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 that just it, it, I'm. I mean, there's so much anxiety that young people are feeling these days. There's so much suicide. There's this, this lack of, um, there's just sort of fear. But, but equal therapy can play such a role in, in, in his, uh, I love that word, healing, and in, in healing these, um, these, uh, these wounds that have been imposed on us by our current um, capitalistic society. Um, mm-hmm. The, the world around us is not just for our consumption and destruction. It's like we just have a, a, so much repairing that needs to be done in our relationship with the other wild creatures. Yeah, and it's it's um, very mutual. And this is um, why I, I really um, this subject is important to me too. Is is that people need to also feel that they can interact with their world. And because I feel like that's a part of the separateness too, is we've been told and been acting like we just use uh, the rest of nature as a resource and not as a living um, comrade. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the yeah. other side of that coin is that we've been told that we suck so much for the state of how things are that we're afraid to engage mm. because we're so tired of being the bad guy. And mm-hmm. both of those are a dead end. So there has to be a place for us to be remembering uh, we have a place in moving plants around, in planting seeds. No one needs to tell us how to do it, actually. Yeah. And part of this understanding I've been telling people when I've been talking to them is that, you know, it's, it's not up to me for that seed to stick or not. I can put it in the ground, but there's so many other things going on to see whether that will actually be Mm -hmm. the place for that plant or not. Especially if I'm not, you know, even in farming with irrigation, that was hard, but, you know, doing, uh, doing tending in more wild places, there's so much beyond my control Mm -hmm. of whether that happens or not. But the the act and the relationship of doing that and revisiting those places and seeing what's happening, there's some really good healing in there where people can actually yeah. have a tangible way to feel connected again in an engaged way, you know? Yes, I can. Um, and about 20 years ago, um, Matt and I moved into this place where we are now, which is, it's, it was an abandoned orange orchard. Um, so that when we moved in, there were the four acres with, with dead trees, but, but we saw the potential. And I just in particular wanted to just be in one place, for a long time and get to know it. And um, so we've been here over 20 years now. And during that time, we've seen this, and we part of it's an orchard, but part of it we've we're just helping grow habitat for birds. So we have mesquite trees and netley packberries, some things we've put in and planted. And then other things that have just come in on their own. And it's just been... Mm-hmm. It's, it's my it's my own personal sanctuary that I, we invite people to, and, and um, it's like a little green space in the middle of, of the city, where it just shows the, the potential for what you can do, uh, and and um, how um, and, and, and I mean, we're really lucky to have these four acres, but still, I look in some people. In the backyard, they might just have dirt or grass. It's like, and I want to just tell them to fill it with plants. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter. You just have a little tiny yard or whatever. It's like, you know, fill it with greenery. Just do something, you know. Yeah. I really liked your description of your place in, in your reading, your writing I was reading this morning, uh, an entanglement of plantings and wildings. And I just thought that was <laughs> such a perfect way of describing <laughs> this, like, just easygoing ability to relate with letting things grow and encouraging them to grow. <laughs> and that um, those two things go together, wildings and plantings. They're not um, mutually exclusive. And that, right. you know, our, right. our, our gardens and these places that we tend, there's so much richness and supportive habitat that comes from that. And it doesn't have to be all planned out or um, guided by right. <laughs> some flow chart, you know. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And it's, a, it's a collaboration. Like I'm involved, Matt's involved, but the birds are involved. Yeah. They're eating things and then. Um, bringing them in and you know, it's just this whole group effort you know um, so it, 
and and again, that's part of belonging because it's not just you. You're part of a community. Yeah. You're part of the system. Right, because part of the, you know, a, a huge part of how we got to the the bad place that we are right now with ecological damage to the planet and climate change and all this is because we've had an adversarial relationship, you know, to, to, to the earth, to the animals, to the plants, you know, and, you know, large scale agriculture is, is kind of by its nature adversarial to the habitat mm-hmm. that it's in because it needs to exclude, you know, everything, you know, and so in that way, mm-hmm. in that way, I see the invasion biology and in that in, in that invasive that, that way of looking at plants that way that adversarial approach just repeated again and i'm like well it was that adversarial approach that got us into trouble that adversarial approach is not going to to help us heal these things at all and so that's really one of right. the biggest issues i have with invasion biology mm-hmm. right the, the same technique that that got you into the the problem in the first place is not going to get you it's not going to solve that problem and get you out of it that's a really good point um yeah i mean it's just like we're, we're just kind of at war with everything we're at war with the with the earth we're at war with we, we have war on wage war on drugs we, you know we wage mm-hmm. war it's like let's stop waging war you know um, maybe that's the problem right right yeah. because you know we can look at a roadside for example which is a you know a constant disturbance and a constant mess and and roadsides are something we need at the moment to move around food and et cetera for ourselves so we need to accept that roads are i mean if we accept that roads are part of our reality now then you know we can look at what's growing at the roadside and be like wow isn't this miraculous isn't this wonderful isn't this beautiful that something is able to take this mess that we made that we brought all these toxic chemicals and all this earth moving machinery and and you know th- these toxic substances in the in the pavement itself and and something's actually growing here and isn't that isn't that beautiful yeah. you know yeah and and the, and the idea of gratitude is is, is important to all mm. this, this healing and this changing of attitudes it's, i mean as you say you, you're out on this this sort of toxic disturbed roadside and there's a plant there and it's like i just feel gratitude i'm i'm glad you're growing there you know? mm-hmm. um and uh yeah, because I mean, and, and, it's so inspirational to see a crack, you know, a, 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 a flower growing from a crack in the sidewalk, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I was thinking this morning about this. I heard a phrase on the radio of like someone was using the derogatory term of calling someone a wilted violet or you know a pansy. Like we have this idea of that that calling someone a plant name is like um, means they're they're not strong enough or, or brave enough. It's like. But man, plants are pretty phenomenal. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they they can they can uh, yeah the, the force of, of of breaking through asphalt, but even just this basic idea they can feed from the sun. You know, and can you do that? You know, yeah. <laughs> like they they can they can take light energy and transform it into food. Like that's pretty miraculous. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> Right. I mean, one could make the argument that plant cells are more sophisticated than animal cells in that sense, couldn't they? Yeah, and, and and we're just hangers on. I mean, if they weren't here, we wouldn't be here. So right, um, <laughs> yeah, we're entirely dependent on plant life. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that people just this idea of plant blindness, where you as, as animals we focus on other animals and ignore the the green creatures that sustain us. So definitely need. I don't know how we go about fixing that, but uh, talking about it is a way to start. Yeah, yeah, encouraging people to interact, you know. And that's, you know, mm-hmm. the, the importance of the other voices out there, too, like like yours and the research that you and Matthew Chu and Mark Davis and these other people we ran across who I just cried when I found them because there aren't that many voices out there giving an alternative um light for people to start to see things from and it's really it's really important and i appreciate it so much <laughs> yeah i'm glad i'm glad and, and matt now has he's been teaching a, a he's still at the university he has a course a field course called uh, novel ecosystems where mm. he gets students out uh once a week and he takes them to places like a a, a dis- a disturbed lot in the city or or, or the, the low regulated river and they, they just talk about um 
what they're seeing and what, what's growing there, what's living there. And then he has them read two different books that um, take different um, sort of perspectives on the invasive species issue. And then he has them come to, um, he has them critically think, think it through and come to their own decision about what's going on. And he's had some students come out of it saying that this is the course, well, one recently just said this course actually was the one that really got them thinking critically and this idea of capacity to be a critical thinker and to make decisions on their own and not just um, um, be spoon-fed um, material. And the course was really important to their development as a, as a scientist. So, mm. but, you know, so that, but, um, so it's, it's good that things like that are happening. But I think one thing that we're saying about the educational system is this, and, and biology in particular, is that there is this loss of um, field courses and support for, for biologists that are taking their students out in the field, partly because hmm. those class sizes get get bigger um, and, and we're... Um, so, so you don't, you have some of the students that are coming out, even of conservation biology programs. They know some theory, but you put them outside in in, in a in a woodlot or something, and they're like, "What? Where am I? What this? You know? wow. <laughs> like this? Actually, the practical their ability to relate to the organisms and to interpret and understand what they're seeing is they're not getting the experience that they need. It's um, yeah. So that there definitely needs to be some changes in, in the educational system. I really want to um, point out that term that you just used because uh, it's it's one that I've, I've been hearing more recently, and I think it's a great term: novel ecosystems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that one's that one's. Uh, I like that 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 has such a positive, you know, feeling feeling to it as, as well as just being a good yes. a, a good descriptor. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's it's embracing this idea of change that. Um, an ecosystem is not some static entity with the same suite of species that's repeating itself across the landscape. But it's a dynamic entity, and um, wherever you go, whether you're in a city or the edge of a field or, or in the heart of the, the, the rainforest, I mean, that you're, you're going to see um, different groups of organisms interacting and... and um, and it also it, it it erases the dichotomy between sort of wilderness and, and non wilderness and and it's mm. accepting that nature is all around us wherever we are and mm. it, it encourages people and, and in his class Matt encourages students like wherever you are like what are you who what are the birds around um, what what are the plants that you're seeing so you're you're, you're the students are sort of learning to to look and observe and wherever they are you don't have to drive out to some wilderness area to be a part of nature you open your front door and um and and see who's there Mm -hmm. so yeah so i think in the 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 term is is nice it's embracing um the idea that the we're in a the world is a dynamic ever-changing place yeah it's it's helpful i think like the word succession uh comes to mind around that stuff too, because I think that in general, there's an assumption that succession is a linear process that repeats itself. And I don't think that that's actually yeah, orderly. That's what... how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nice phrase, but it's gotten so caught up with this idea of, of orderly predictable or orderly predictability that it, I... I find myself wanting to use it, but then I back off using it <laughs> yeah. because, um, um, for that very reason. Yeah, it's hard to find the words sometimes because there you have to redefine are... them. <laughs> yeah. To help people understand. And, and and sometimes terms, there will be, Clements was the, the plant ecologist who helped popularize that, that idea of plant succession and of imbued it with his um, his ideas, and there was another plant ecologist named Gleason, and so there was this, and Gleason was more of this individualistic school. This was back in the 1920s, I think, um, saying that that because um, Clemens was was this orderly idea that 
he was saying that you go out and you'll find a suite of plants and, and then you'll have disturbance and another suite will come in and it's very predictable and gleese and um and, and the counterpoint was was that no the, the world is a more random place you know maybe this seed will come in this time but not the other time and so you have this, this individualistic idea of, of the plant community and so there was this this, this tension between the sort of randomness and and dynamism has, versus the the controlled and predictability is the tension that's been there for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Well, we've been talking for for a bit over an hour. I think that that that's a good a uh, good amount. We've covered a lot of different things here, and maybe just to to close, would there be one thing you would say to people to sort of sum things up if like they've you know haven't haven't looked into a lot of things haven't done a lot of their research you know like to 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 um what would you say to them to encourage them to be skeptical about this label invasive i would ask them would they want to have that label applied to them i would ask them just when they hear that phrase, set it aside, go out, get to know that plant on your own terms, befriend it. I would suggest to them, we are not at war with plants. I would reframe the argument and say, think of plants as your friends. Get to know them. Don't be co-opted by the militaristic view of, of nature. You you can challenge what other people are saying and do your own own thinking about it. Stay open minded and 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 I'm sort of the cognitive the neurobiologists say that it's, it's we're sort of hardwired to react to negative events than to positive, and so it's easier to to hang on to the negative and to ignore the positive. So we have to work harder to to appreciate things sometimes. So just realize that. If, if, if someone's calling something invasive, maybe there's there's something it's doing that they don't like, but there may be other things that the plant is doing that you may like. Um, so think about the positives that may be happening as well as the negatives. And also, I would just say, let's maybe stop being so judgy. <laughs> like, um, we we judge, like, who are, who are we to be judging that? And And... Would you want to be judged that way? No, those are all good points. It's really appreciated. And and, and uh, it was really great of you to spend uh, so much time talking to us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a treat. Well, thank you guys. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.